The Governance, Law, and Economics Lecture Series is designed to highlight those three institutions that need to work together to support and defend a free civil society. Those institutions are good governance, the rule of law, and market-based institutions. And when those three things work together, what we're able to do is create space that enables people to use their skills, their talents, their diversity to create value for people in their community. Our speaker this evening is a good friend of mine. Dr. Scott Bullier is the Dean of the College of Business at North Dakota State University. Like myself, he's an economist by training, but he spent his career actively engaged in trying to understand and advocating for policies that foster dynamic, vibrant economies that best allow those principled entrepreneurs to create value for people. But he's also noticed that even though policies are important, it really comes down to the people. That people, innovative, creative, dedicated business leaders, are the lifeblood of the economy. And freeing them to create value for people is highly important. Prior to joining North Dakota State, Dr. Bullier served as the Executive Director for the Center of the Study of Economic Liberty at the W.P. Carey School of Business at Arizona State University. From 2010 to 2015, he served as the Executive Director of the Manley Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. And under his leadership there, he was able to accumulate a wonderful talent pool of economists that have had a large impact. For example, they created an economics major and a Master's of Arts degree in economics. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say that at least one of my former undergraduates actually is in that program. In addition to leading the Johnson Center, Dr. Bullier served as the chair and division uh, head of economics and finance at Troy University. And early in his career at Mercer University, he was the BB&T Distinguished Professor of Capitalism, the chair of e the economics department, and the director of the Center for Undergraduate Research in Public Policy and Capitalism. He earned his undergraduate degree from Northern Michigan University and his PhD in economics from George Mason University. Tonight's program will be a 50-minute presentation, followed by 10 minutes of questions and answers. So if you will, please join me in providing a warm ESU welcome to Dr. Scott Bullier. Well, thank you all uh, for coming out tonight. Great to be here. Uh, you're all neighbors uh, for me, uh, North Dakota, Kansas. It's all kind of out here on the prairie. Uh, it's great to get down a little south. Uh, I'll go back home tomorrow morning. There's two inches of snow overnight and then five more. Um, uh, what's tomorrow, Friday? So two inches tonight, five more tomorrow night. Uh, so getting away for a night feels really good. Has it been like a terrible winter down here? Um, it's been awful in uh, Fargo, North Dakota. So great to be uh, away. You all are really lucky to have uh, Dr. Yonai here as a professor. He and I go way back. First met Eric in 2000. Uh, and uh, uh, it was on a recruitment trip. I was being recruited to George Mason. And uh, we went out, to, uh, out, out for drinks in Fairfax uh, way back. And he's a wonderful professor. Uh, his uh, resume is uh, uh, one that I could go on and on about too, which means mainly he's getting old. Just like me. <laughs> uh, besides Dean, I don't get to talk to students much. All right, my days are filled with meetings, dealing with faculty issues, um, dealing with the really bad students, the ones that like you know are persistent and they won't go away. You know, so it's like it's nice to be here and to be talking about something. I honestly haven't thought about in a long time. So I'm gonna frame this with a story and then just get into like 20 slides of data. Um, I, like back in 2000, early in my career as a grad student, you're searching around looking for topics to do research on so that you can get this dissertation written out the door and then go and get a job. And it's, it's a bear, like you have to write 120 pages of content that's original, new, propose it, have it ripped apart by some really smart professors, and then write some more, and then defend it. And it's like a daunting task. In the early 2000s, the hot topic that a lot of people were interested in, in economics, was development. Okay, the big question was why are some countries rich and other countries poor? Okay, it was like the question economists were most fascinated about. Today, if you were in grad school, the big question economists are interested in is income inequality. Like why are some countries um, really uneven in terms of income, like you have rich and poor, and then you have other countries where everyone's making about the same amount of money. That's the big hot question right now in economics. 
is it really 18 years ago? Yeah, 18 years ago, all right, when I was uh, your age, all right, closer to your age, uh, the big question was why are some countries rich and others poor? So I uh, wanted to get into that conversation. And I went to George Mason and uh, did a lot of analysis and work in African economic development, okay? So I was interested in what's going on in Africa. Um, as I'll get into in some of the slides in a minute, there's something economists call the African growth tragedy. So from the time that Africa became, uh, most African nations became independent around 1960, all the way through 2000, it's like a flat line when you look at economic growth for the region, okay? Completely flat. They became independent and their fortunes didn't change at all. And the rest of the world over this time has enjoyed tremendous takeoffs in prosperity, all right? The rest of the world has gotten much richer. And there's a lot of really interesting and compelling stories. Hong Kong in 1960 was just this rocky island with slums. Has anyone been to Hong Kong? Do you know the Hong Kong? Neat. Do you know the Hong Kong story? Okay, it went from nothing to the most prosperous place on the planet today in 40 years, okay? Africa, meanwhile, just flat, all right? So economists were asking, what's going on in Africa? Okay, why? is Africa so poor and what can be done about it? And I became like a bit player, really small contributor to the what's going on in Africa literature. And the main thing I was interested in was a small country. Uh, well, it's not that small, it's the size of Texas, but in Africa it's small, okay? Uh, the country of Botswana. Uh, Botswana was the one country in Sub-Saharan Africa that was bucking the trend. So you have this trend where everyone is remaining dirt poor and then you have one country that's enjoying this massive takeoff in income. And they're basically a middle income country today. They're like Greece, right? Greece. The Greeks aren't like starving, okay? The Greeks actually are taking like eight week holidays in the summertime. They're eating dolmas, all right? Anyone have a dolma? Like, you know, like fig leaves wrapped up with rice inside of them, all right? They're eating olives and drinking wine. The Greeks are doing pretty all right. And this one country in the middle of Africa, Botswana, is living like that. And all around it, you have dysfunction. All of these places that are really, really poor. And my story um, was basically what Derek was describing uh, at the beginning. It was a story of good institutions, good people, and good policy all working together to fuel an economic miracle. It was like the Hong Kong of Sub-Saharan Africa, and very few people knew about it. Okay. So that's like the early 2000s. Derek calls me up um, back in January and says, do you want to come and help me out? You know, can you give a talk on Africa? And I'm like, oh, sure. You know, I've talked about Botswana a zillion times. I can roll out the Botswana story. You all have no idea where Botswana even is. This will be compelling. <laughs> and then I started to dig into the data and said, actually, there's something really more interesting than just talking about Botswana that I can do tonight. It'll be original. It's fresh. And I think it's much bigger in terms of the stakes that are at play here. So let's get into it a little bit. About uh, 20 slides that you'll have to bear uh, with here. How, I need to know my audience. So you all are econ students for the most part? Are you, you're all here by force, basically. <laughs> <laughs> like you're suffering through econ. I was told that you're here because then you don't have to have class tomorrow. That's a good deal, right? Like get, through, get through an hour of me, no class tomorrow. That's not bad. I, I struggle as a dean all the time. My biggest fear, uh, week in and week out, is the events that we have, major guest speakers coming to, and then attendance is flat. And I've tried everything. Like, I throw pizza at students, you know, I throw, um, like, prizes, you know, and then sometimes they just don't show up, and you're like, oh, my God, that's so embarrassing. This is a good one. Like, you don't have to have class in the morning. Is it a morning class? Smart, all right? So uh, you all are going to be so happy tonight uh, that you just suffered through 20 slides of Africa. Okay, here's the African tragedy. Can you all see that okay? All right, this is um, from 1960 to 2000 for Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, the only part of Africa I'm talking about is south of the Sahara. This is how economists generally approach Africa. North of the Sahara, it's like a different culture. They're Mediterranean in their orientation. They're um, uh, Middle Eastern in their orientation, and it's just like a different animal. South of the Sahara Desert, uh, you can talk about Africa more as a whole. Now, it's still really sloppy to talk about a region that big and say, well, what's going on in Sub-Saharan Africa? Do you like talking about all of the United States? 
what's happening in Kansas is different than North Dakota. But we're going to just do some sweeping um, description tonight, okay, so that you get a little more knowledge of Africa than you had coming in. That's the African tragedy. That was the puzzle um, that I tried to solve early in my career. And as a young economist some 18 years ago, I would often juxtapose the, the um, Botswana graph on here. So if you were to look at Botswana in 1960, they actually were down here. Third, I should have done it, all right? Third poorest country in the world. And it just went up and up and up and up from 1960 to 2000. Okay, just a massive takeoff. So you have the rest of Africa really poor, and then Botswana prospering like mad. Okay, really fascinating. That's the African tragedy. That's what I thought I'd be talking about tonight. But then I looked at like what's going on in Africa in the last 15 years. Okay, I haven't looked at data on Africa in probably 10 years, honestly. Okay, like just I, I'm a dean. I'm busy. I'm like dealing with student issues, okay? Uh, I have faculty like wanting my jugular, all right? Uh, I don't have time to look at Africa. When I looked at it in preparation for this talk, uh, I said, holy smokes, okay? Sub-Saharan Africa is actually enjoying a decent uptick in gross domestic product per capita. Now, this isn't all that great, okay? But it's, you're moving from about 1,200 to 1,500, 1,600. It's a lot better than what they've been doing, okay? And it's the other slides that I'm gonna get into in a few minutes that I think are even more compelling. These are US dollars. African dollars actually get you farther. So if we were to put things into something called purchasing power parity, which you might learn about in macro, okay? Is, is Derek teaching macro for you? Your next class, he can tell you about purchasing power parity, all right? <laughs> if you put this into purchasing power parity, these dollars that Africans are earning have a little more oomph to them than what I'm reporting up here. Because prices are really quite low in Africa, okay, in general. So they have a little more purchasing power. So this isn't a really exciting chart, but it was interesting enough for me to say, gosh, I better look at something else. I expected this to be flat. I expected it to be down, in fact, all right? You hear so much negative news about Africa, all right? You hear about, um, you know, governments and anarchy and collapsing. You hear about, um, you know, the, the risk and the possibilities of genocide. You hear about Zimbabwe and hyperinflation. This surprised me, okay? That it's actually trending up a little bit. And then I dug in a little more and looked at some other um, uh, pieces of information, some indicators <clears throat> that made me say, wow, this is something way more interesting to talk about, okay? So income is nice, all right? Some of you may be young and just naive about the world and think, I don't need money, all right? Wait 10 years, wait 20 years. Money's really nice, okay? Money is the grease that just makes life a little bit easier. Is money everything? Of course not, okay? Money doesn't equal happiness, we know this, but money just helps serve as a means in getting some of the things that you want in life, okay? But money isn't all that's important when you think about a good life. One thing I'd say is way more important is actually living a decent length, okay? So what I did was looked at income first and said, huh, that's trending up. What's going on with life expectancy? Because that's a much more reliable indicator of life getting better, okay? Is if you're living longer, okay? And these, these aren't like, if these aren't differences where they're going from living to be, living 80 years of life and moving to 90, okay? That's not the relevant comparison here, where if you lived, if, if your average life was 80 and we were able to stretch life to 90, I don't know if that's really great, okay? Like, your 80s aren't a picnic by any means, all right? This is pretty cool what's happening in Africa, though. In the year 2000, Life expectancy for Sub-Saharan Africa, tragically, and this is why we call it the African tragedy, is 50 years. I'm 40. I'm getting long in the tooth if I'm in Africa, okay? Here in America, I think I've just gotten started. In Africa, average life expectancy in the year 2000 is 50. Look what's happened to that in a 16-year period. It's gone from 50 to 60, okay? Every three years, 
a year of life is being added. Okay? That's remarkable. Nowhere else in the world is experiencing that kind of takeoff in life expectancy. Living from 50 on average to 60 is the difference between never seeing your grandchildren and actually seeing them for several years. Okay, most people don't have grandchildren when they're 50, or they just are born. Now you can see them on average till they're 10 years old. One of the things that gives people greatest joy when you look at happiness research is having grandchildren, okay? Way more than having your own kids. Like you have your own kids, I have three at home, all right? Three at home, they're fabulous, but I wanna kill them. Because every, every day is like, oh my God, you've gotta be kidding me. My wife was texting me today, and. It was 34, so she took the kids out for a walk, okay? And um, it's like mud season. Do you guys, do you even have mud season here? Like, you don't get enough snow to have mud season. All right, so we're in the three-week period where it's just mud everywhere, all right? And there's puddles, and the snow's slowly melting, and it's horrible. My seven-year-old daughter goes walking along and crashes through the puddle, all right? And it's like there's a layer of ice. There's water that's unknown in terms of its depth, and she just goes crashing through it with one boot. And then she's so worried about the other boot crashing through that she collapses on her knees because she said, I'm distributing my weight. And she went through completely, all right? And this is what life at home is like, is my kids uh, love them, okay? They're really amazing. But what I'm really hoping for is they, they make it to adulthood, have grandkids that I can really enjoy, all right? And that'll give me lots and lots of happiness, all right? Africans are getting that now more than ever. Life expectancy is climbing in Africa. And it's climbing for a couple of different reasons. It's climbing because Africans are eating a little bit more, okay? But more importantly, some really vicious diseases are on the decline, and nobody saw this coming. That there'd be massive drops in several really vicious and ugly diseases. So let's get into that a little bit. This is infant mortality, which goes hand in hand with the rise in life expectancy. So this is the number of kids per 1,000 live births that don't make it, okay? Does anyone know what the rate is in the United States for infant mortality per 1,000? Anyone want to take a guess? 17. It's around 10. Okay? 10. And that's high. The United States is high compared to some Western European countries when it comes to infant mortality per 1,000. In 2000, when I was studying in Africa, infant mortality was almost 100 per 1,000. So you're a mother excited about having a kid, one in 10 chance that kid doesn't make it to the world, okay? Or dies shortly after being born. Okay, the, the measure here, I believe, is uh, uh, death before, it's either two or five. Okay, I can't remember which one it is, but not making it till your fifth birthday or not making it till your second. We take for granted that people will have healthy pregnancies, that the kids will be just fine, that even my seven-year-old going through puddles is gonna live just fine and make it to like age 80, all right? Uh, we take that for granted. In Africa, that's far from a guarantee. But look what's happened to that line since I last looked at Africa, 2016, it's down to um, almost 50 per 1,000. Would you want to go to Africa and have your kid? Probably not, compared to our standards. But look what's happened in the last 15 years, all in a 15-year period. So they're living longer. They're eating better. They're making a little bit more money. They're getting to see their kids, okay? The kids are not dying at rates that they used to. And here's another really big miracle happening. So Botswana, the thing that I got knocked for in my research and really had to um, you know, wrestle with in terms of like not overselling the Botswana miracle was the effect that HIV and AIDS was having in that country. So Botswana had an HIV and AIDS rate when I was studying it somewhere between 55 and 60%. Okay, that is consistent with what you see in here. There's 0 0.5, okay, HIV and AIDS rate in people, I believe, 14 and older, okay? Again, what's happened here? The prediction was Africa was going to be completely gutted by the HIV and AIDS crisis. 
You have a lot of different things contributing to a significant decline in HIV and AIDS. Now our official estimates are down around 20%. Not great, okay, 20% is still awfully high, but not anywhere near what it was the last time I looked at the evidence in Africa, okay? Why is HIV and AIDS falling? A few different things. Awareness, okay? Really upfront and in your face, um, marketing and messaging about how AIDS is transmitted. So things that we would consider um, offensive advertising, they're just putting right in front of people saying, we need to talk seriously about AIDS. Leadership actually saying um, that HIV and AIDS is a real problem. So you have a past generation of leaders in Africa that actually, in some cases, were denying that AIDS gets transmitted in the ways that it gets transmitted, okay? So there's been major cultural change. Along with it, um, the AIDS community has been very good at the Gates Foundation and other major aid organizations have been very good at getting information and treatment into Sub-Saharan Africa compared to what they were doing in the early 2000s, okay? So just all part of the story I'm telling of something is going on in Africa that's pretty remarkable, right? The other big killer in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa is malaria, right? <clears throat> uh, this, these are the rates, the death rates, okay, per 100,000 people in the year 2000 in Africa, okay? Most of Sub-Saharan Africa is in the dark red. Note that almost nowhere else in the world do you have death rates like that. Malaria is an underdevelopment problem. Do you all know that like when the Panama Canal was being built, malaria was a massive problem in the Western Hemisphere? Malaria in Louisiana, Florida was a real thing. We're all insulated from that now. Essentially, there's like a tiny little blue that I can see here in a South American country, I don't know, all right? Like it's a tiny little blue. You get to Africa, the whole thing is red. And it's like the only part of the world that's really affected still by malaria. That's what it looks like in the year 2000. Pay attention. Capture that. Here's what it looks like today. Not paradise, okay? If you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you still probably want to take your malaria pills, okay? But it's certainly not quite as bad as it was here. Dark red, lighter red, some oranges, yellows. A couple countries going completely white, which means you don't need to really worry about it much. I went to Botswana in the year 2004. I did field work and spent the summer there. Botswana, by the way, is right here. Looks like a really tiny little country. That's Texas. It's the size of Texas, okay? So went there in 2000, got loaded up with shots before my trip, okay, because that's what they told us to do. I was told that make sure I boil all of my water, don't eat eggs, don't eat anything that's scary. Uh, and we were told to take malaria pills. We got there and the locals were laughing at us. Okay, the water is just fine, all right, totally fine. You don't need your malaria pills at all, okay, because they actually have developed and have addressed the issues that mosquitoes bring in urban areas. We were mostly in the cities, we were fine, not needing the malaria pills. That's what development does, okay? The rest of Africa is making their way on the same course that South Africa and Botswana have, okay? Here's what it looks like <clears throat> in terms of um, another malaria indicator. So this was controversial in 2000, the distribution of insecticide-treated malaria nets. All right, so these are nets that you use when you sleep to keep the mosquitoes away from you, essentially. Uh, a lot of people were critical of the aid community dispersing these nets on African villages. Like, that's not the thing that Africans need the most. They need cash, they need food, they need this, they need that. And there were stories of Africans using the nets and repurposing them for fishing. Okay, so they take the nets that they were given, use them for fishing instead because they weren't that worried about malaria. Well, they actually educated a lot of communities that you really ought to use the nets. This is saving you from like an agonizing, nightmarish disease. Okay, malaria is just brutal in terms of what it does to you. It cripples your uh, immune system, essentially. 
your nervous system gets fried. It's like the worst hangover you've ever had, day after day after day. Okay. Uh, over time, the aid community has penetrated into um, the African uh, uh, scene. You have much greater use, and you have much greater effectiveness uh, that is explaining the graphs I just showed you on malaria. Okay? All of this is just, again, going back to social indicators that are really important. And here's what it looks like in, in hard numbers. So malaria had 422 incidents per 1,000 people. Can you imagine that? Just, if you were living there, 42% chance of getting malaria. It's amazing, all right? Now it's only a 23% chance, 234 per 1,000. It's not paradise. If you're trying to like wrap your mind around what is Sub-Saharan Africa like as a whole, picture 1900 America, maybe 1890 America. Would you like to go back to 1890 America? Maybe for like a day, right? And then like get me out of there, right? No smartphones, all right? People using their outhouse or their bedpans because there's not indoor plumbing. Electricity is something that like Edison's playing with. Maybe he's not even born yet, okay? So like they're playing around with electricity. We can use candles for light. Africa's a little bit ahead of that, but that's approximately where they're at. So it's no picnic. But the trend is looking awfully interesting. Tuberculosis, again, something that you don't um, worry about too much in the United States. Like TB actually is occasional here in the United States, and it's a really big deal if you hear about a TB case. I was driving over here from the airport today, and there's measles cases here in the state of Kansas. And they were freaking out about 13 measles cases, okay? Africa can take that problem and amplify it to the 10th power. Oh, wow, you had 13 measles cases, all right? We had, in 2000, 333 TB cases per 1,000 people. But don't worry, things are getting better. It's down to 233. Those are big changes, even if the overall scene is still not pretty, okay? So why is this happening? <coughs> What's going on? I'm going to shift gears. I, I needed to present all that for you to buy me, buy my point that Africa's changed. Africa's different. If I went back to Africa, I'd be, um, you know, kind of confused. All right. I have a mental model of what's going on there that it's just it's flat, and then there's Botswana, and in fact, there's a whole bunch of places that are actually doing pretty well. Why? <laughs> well. Leadership is one of the issues, and that's a theme of this uh, uh, program, actually, is leadership's in the title, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, leadership is in the title of, uh, of the amazing center you all have here. Leadership matters a lot in poor countries. And the evidence here that economists have when it comes to leadership and development is that leaders tend to be, like, all over the place. We know this in America a little bit, right? Like, I mean, there's a lot of noise that comes from leaders. They wag their tails a lot, okay? And sometimes you can have a cluster of leaders that are above average and exceptional in a good direction, and sometimes you can have a, a cluster of leaders that are horrible. The trend in Africa when it comes to young leaders is positive, and I'll get into that in just a minute, okay? <clears throat> um, along with that, other factors that are uh, driving the African miracle, the aid community, continues to improve in the approach they're taking with Africa. And some of those results are bearing fruit. Demographics, I'll show you a slide or two that make demographics an interesting part of it, education and then institutions as well. Okay, so these are the factors we'll dig in and talk about uh, a little bit in my remaining time here. <clears throat> so first, it's important to recognize that Africa has a history of really good leaders. It's just that they also have a history of really, really lousy leaders, okay? Some of the best leaders in the world, probably the best leader of the last 30 years. You guys know who this is? No. Mandela, okay? This is uh, Liberia's president. She just finished up in 2016, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Liberian president. This is my uh, hero because he helped fuel, uh, has anyone seen the movie about this guy? His name's Suretse Kama. There's like a very small independent movie 
So you don't have class tomorrow morning, you should try to like track down like a pirated version of Serenze Kama. It's like a romantic movie, all right? Serenze Kama was Botswana's first independent post-colonial leader, all right? Really controversial leader because he married a white English woman. The, um, the, the, the government of what was South, it was South Africa at the time didn't want to let him come back to the continent after marrying Ruth, uh, Ruth Wilson. Uh, he ran Botswana in the early days with something that they call uh, cosmopolitan humanitarianism. He took the approach, all of his neighbors were totally dysfunctional, okay? They were running racist regimes, essentially. You all know that South Africa until the early 1990s was apartheid, right? Zimbabwe was Rhodesia at the time and wasn't much better. Then you have this little country the size of Texas called Botswana that said, we don't have much for defense, we're dirt poor, we're just going to open ourselves up and if people want to come, they can come. And if someone wants to invade us, we'll just cry out and say, someone help us. And that was their, their foreign policy strategy. Like, we're not gonna, we can't arm ourselves to even compete with South Africa. We have no money for major defense. If they want to take us, we'll cry out to the rest of the world and hope to God someone helps. And it worked. It was an effective strategy. They had immigration come into their country, fuel a lot of their economic growth, and it was an environment of tolerance, okay? So you have some really interesting leaders in Africa that have fueled the past development, and it's this generation of leaders that the young leadership is drawing on as we look into this uh, century for economic growth. So they have a history of good leadership in the country that's, uh, that's helping fuel this group. I mentioned as point two that the aid community, when it comes to working with Africa, has figured a few things out. So the aid community, if you were to go back to the year 2000, was basically saying to themselves, holy smokes, we've given Africa a lot of money. And they've taken that money and they've lit it on fire. That was the consensus in the early 2000s. So there's a book that you all should look up. It's by William Easterly. It's called The Elusive Quest for Growth. Easterly has one chart in that book that's extremely powerful. It's, it's the amount of aid to, I think it's the country of Zaire, I can't remember, Zambia. It might be Zaire or Zambia. Um, the amount of aid given, it's like an X. So they kept giving money and economic growth just kept falling, okay? Billions and billions of dollars in aid and economic growth kept falling. Why is that? Well, they kept giving it to corrupt leaders who put it into pet projects and didn't help the people. And then what did the leaders do after they ran out of money? They said, my people are starving, I need more money. And they kept coming back to the West and getting more money and more money and more money. And you see this in official debt that Sub-Saharan Africa owed the rest of the world. They technically owe the World Bank money. They owe the IMF money when they're given aid, okay? It's just really hard for them to repay it. Well, they started to place greater conditionality on loans in the early 2000s and say, we'll give you this money, but you need to do X, Y, and Z to clean up your act, okay? You have to pursue policies that are actually going to help your country grow. And that was the conditional like, revolution, essentially, in, in the aid world, okay? And what happened was Africa started to grow, and at the same time that it was growing, its reliance on Western debt shrunk massively. So Sub-Saharan African debt today, as a percentage of GDP, is actually not too shabby. When you look around at this map, these are the various countries. This is government debt as a percent of GDP. I'll show you a chart in the next chart to illustrate like where we are in the United States and give you some perspective of how we're doing relative to Africa. Africa has come a long way in a short period of time in getting its fiscal house in order, not be over leveraged on the debt side of things, and it's led to significant changes in investment. So keep in mind this chart. This is Sub-Saharan Africa, total debt, okay? <coughs> Total debt as a percent of gross national income, very reasonable. Just to understand that not all countries are like this, here is 
the United States, all right, this is just in pure dollars. We're up around $20 trillion of debt in the United States. That's over 100% of GDP. Okay, so we just keep spending like we're on the blues in America, all right? You all know that this is an issue, 100%. That's not even close to where Africa was, and Africa has come down since then. As Africa has had declining public debt, they've had rising foreign direct investment. So another one of the puzzles when I was a researcher in the early 2000s was why can't Africa attract investment? Where is the Western money? You go to Africa and you don't see Macy's, okay? You don't, don't even see many McDonald's's, right? Like one good indicator for like a functional country is if they have a McDonald's. There's lots of countries in Africa that don't, okay? Where is it? Well, for a long period of time, foreign direct investment was dry when it came to Africa. Would you want to touch a country with a 10-foot pole that has dysfunctional governments, corrupt leaders, all right, low education, which I'll get to in just a minute, high debt, like what investor wants to take on that combo meal? Right? I just mentioned I'm hungry. I just mentioned McDonald's and now I've got a combo meal on my mind. All right. Since the 2000s, look at the correlation here. Since the early 2000s, all right. You have debt declining. They're borrowing less money. And at the same time as they're borrowing less money, they're attracting more <coughs> foreign direct investment. A lot of this, anyone want to guess where a lot of it is coming from? China. Okay. The Chinese economic growth miracle is helping lift Africa, interestingly enough. Okay. So just another indicator that things are headed in a very positive direction in Africa. Here's why I think there's reason to bet on it and think it's going to continue. These are the favorable demographics that Sub-Saharan Africa faces relative to the rest of the world. These are youth in the age 15 to 24 age bracket as a proportion of the 15 to 64 population. You all tracking me on what this indicator means? How many 15 to 24 year olds do you have, all right? relative to your bigger adult population, age 15 to 64. In Sub-Saharan Africa, they have tons and tons of young people in percent terms. When you look at some of the past economic revolutions, all right, when you look at, say, the, some of the Asian miracles, when did those happen? Asia's kind of stale now. Okay, China has stabilized to a much lower economic growth rate today. They enjoyed their economic revolutions when they had lots of young people as a percentage of the total. Why are young people as a percent of the total important? You all are amazingly productive potential, okay? If you need to like go all-nighters for like a week straight, you can do it. You get to my age and like you're done with this talk and like put a fork in me. I'm done for the night, all right? You guys are just getting started. So you're amazingly productive, okay? You're amazingly savvy with tech and you know, new, new trends when it comes to entrepreneurialism. This is where China back in the 1990s became like a major hub, not only for like heavy industry like textiles and manufacturing, it also became a magnet for um, uh, tech companies. When you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, it has even better demographics going for it than China did when the China miracle really began, okay? Pretty interesting. This is why now we're shifting from something interesting is happening in Africa, here are reasons why, now we're getting into maybe it's going to last, okay? Now you have to remember I'm an economist, so everything I say about the future is totally worthless, all right? So I just told you that Africa is going to grow like crazy, Derek will have me back in 15 years and I'll be dead wrong. Okay, that's how trends work in economics, is they're mostly worthless. But I'm giving it my best, all right? Giving it a shot and saying, actually, Africa's breaking out. Why am I saying that? Because I believe it, but also it's really interesting, all right? And it'd be really great if that happens. Here's another reason to think that Africa is on the cusp of a major revolution. 
Lower secondary completion rates, okay, <clears throat> are on the rise. Why did Africa not have foreign direct investment in the 70s, 80s, early 90s? Look at where their education levels were, all right? Do you want to come in there as an outside investor and have less than, well, less than 25% of your population not even achieving a lower post-secondary education? Their trends today are basically where Mexico was when Mexico became um, a fairly reliable trade partner for many other countries. Trade, corporations, investment, follow talent. In Africa, has more human capital today than it ever did, all right? And that trend looks like it's set to continue as well. Now let's get to institutions. <clears throat> this is a graph illustrating what's happened since 1816, okay, all the way to 2015, when it comes to how you're governed. All right? There's the old Winston Churchill line that democracy is... Uh, not a great form, what is it? It's not, it's not a great form of government, but it's better than anything else we have, okay? I'm not crazy about democracy, but I sure am not crazy about any other alternative that's like a reasonable alternative. Like the thought of like living under the rule of one person, I'd never choose that. That sounds really scary. Democracy gives a certain amount of accountability, all right? It constrains leaders to some extent, and what's happened in Africa is that the population living under democracy, and what we mean by democracy is like actual two-party elections that aren't shams, like it's not Russian democracy. Like Putin just had an election, right? And like it was like 97% support him. Okay, that's not really what we mean by democracy, right? Two-party, open, fair elections, as fair as they get. I mean, we have fairness election problems in America, all right? So like fair within boundaries, all right? More than half the population is living under democracy. I think this is a good thing in its own end. It's also another indicator that Africa is experiencing some kind of breakthrough or change. The fact that the people are saying, you know what? We want a hand in govern governance of our country. Right? And that's been steadily on the rise. As that's happened, the population living under, the, under authoritarian regimes has been declining somewhat uh, over time. <clears throat> Here's what it looks like since 1985. These are all the autocracies. Like, almost all of Africa is ruled by dictators in 1985. Africa had a really crazy post-colonial experience as a whole. What happened is they came out of colonialism in the early 1960s, and a lot of the leaders embraced Karl Marx and said, you know what, we like Marxism. So they became, to some extent, versions of the Soviet Union. It was just on another continent. So in the 1980s, being like Russia is still pretty cool. Okay, the Berlin Wall doesn't collapse until 1989. Just having centrally planned economies is still kind of in vogue, right? 30 years later, you've got all kinds of different colors in terms of what Africa is going. In fact, you have some places that are extremely stable and quite democratic in terms of the rights people enjoy when it comes to voice, when it comes to transparency, when it comes to freedom of the press and free speech. So it's a much different place, a place that appears to be um, getting more liberal and open over time, okay? Democracy, the rule of law, institutions that restrain authoritarian leaders all contribute positively to economic growth. And the dominoes are falling around Africa. It's harder to pull off like a horrible regime today relative to what it was in 1985. You think of what happens even when it comes to someone really behaving badly today relative to 1985. In 1985, you could still pull the wool over people with propaganda. 
Do you know how hard it would be to run a propaganda regime today? I mean, it's, it's pretty tough, all right? What happens if someone like says something that's, well, here, here's an example, all right? If I say something that's totally BS right now, what can you all do to check me on it? Get your phone out and check me, call me on it. Okay, in fact, hopefully you have been, like fact checking me the whole time, all right? It makes my job about 100 times harder than in 1985, where you can just tell people whatever you want and they have to go to a library to try track, tracking it down, all right? So leaders are more accountable today than ever before. And they can't lie and they can't cheat to the same extent that they did gener a generation or two ago. Now what they can do is like pull the old fake news, like it's all fake, all right? And I'm not trying to like just pick on our administration in the United States. You can do like the, yep, it's all baloney. That's really hard to pull off, okay? There's some truth, and the truth is more accessible to Africans today, and it's more accessible to anyone in the world today than ever before. And that's the only part of this revolution, all right? Last, and I don't wanna oversell this one because it's mixed in terms of uh, some of the uh, results. I don't know if in your macroeconomics class you all have seen the economic freedom of the world presentations or slides yet. It's something that I'm sure is a critical element of the center's mission and focus. Uh, but in Africa, there's five countries to watch when you're talking about sub-Saharan Africa. These are like the heavyweights of the continent, right? This is like California, New York, Texas, Florida, and blah, whatever our fifth most <laughs> awesome state is. Okay, Kansas, all right? It's those five, all right? These are the five heavyweights in Sub-Saharan Africa. If they're moving in the right direction, they can literally pull the entire continent because they're so big, okay? And if you look at what's happening with their economic freedom, it's improving a little bit, okay? Not in all cases, but it's improving somewhat in some of the big ones. Nigeria is one of the real big heavyweights. It's improved massively in the areas of labor market deregulation openness to trade, size of government. The government is spending less of the people's money, which means the people have more of it to put to work in the private economy, okay? South Africa has basically remained steady for a really long period of time. Angola, Ethiopia is about the same. Ghana has had uh, a significant improvement over time. These aren't great changes, all right? They're still in the category of somewhat free, not really free. But the direction of change is somewhat positive. And it's again suggestive of something happening in Africa that's awfully juicy. And I'm going to end just with a couple of recent, these are really recent, like in the last two weeks, recent headlines out of Africa <clears throat> that should have you thinking, maybe this is the moment where there's actually a breakthrough happening. Why wouldn't it be now, okay? Uh, just this month, every country in Sub-Saharan Africa except Nigeria announced that they're going to join a trade union. So that in all of Africa, they stop imposing tariffs on each other. You all know what a tariff is? It's a tax on another country. In the United States, thankfully, we don't have tariffs. Like Kansas can't tax the North Dakota that comes and visits, all right? Although you do have the toll roads. What is with that? Right? Like, what a pain. Like, it actually affected like, my decision of whether to go to the bathroom or not. Like, I don't want to deal with this machine twice, so I held it a really long time. Um, there's, there's not tariffs internally. Like, you can't tax me in North Dakota. You go to different African countries, and they all have different tax rates. And they tax imports, even though they're like really close to each other. It creates added bureaucracy. It creates lots of incentives to be corrupt. Okay, oh yeah, we'll import your chickens, but you need to pay me a bribe. And they're getting rid of this across the board. It's like the European Union or the United States has suddenly come to Africa. And it could be tremendous in terms of what it means for the future. Another reason to be very bullish and uh, excited about what's happening is just general forecasts. I'm not the only one saying something's happening in Africa that's very positive. The uh, World Bank is forecasting 3.5% growth for Africa for 2019 and 2020. 
For the last 15 years in the United States, just to give you a point of contrast, we've had 1.75% growth. So twice what we're doing, all right? Those kinds of numbers matter, and I hope I've uh, demonstrated that to some extent. Small changes in income in Africa mean big changes in human dignity and flourishing. That's what I came to talk about. I had no idea beforehand I was going to talk about Africa as a whole, um, but it was fun to get into it and do it. So thank you for your attention. Happy to take some questions. Um, thank you.